Good morning. It is a delight to see you here this morning. As always, we are thankful for your presence and the opportunity that's ours to assemble together and to study a portion of God's Word and to give Him the glory that He is due. This morning, our subject is salvation. In fact, it comes from this text. Uh, I call it the greatest question ever asked. I think it is, and I don't know one more important than the question of salvation. What must I do to be saved? That's what a jailer asked the Apostle Paul as he fell before him there in that prison in Philippi. Now, I do want you to understand the purpose behind this series of sermons. We will actually start a series of thoughts relative to salvation. Comes at a pretty good time since we just had Missions Month. And uh, so we'll discuss salvation ultimately over several weeks, and we'll talk about that. Inevitably, we're going to talk about faith because that's how we are saved. If you are a member of the Lord's church, it's very likely you have tried to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what our Lord commissioned us to do, and that's what we take very seriously, our love for the souls of men. We want people to be saved and enjoy the same blessings that we enjoy. Someone shared it with us, and it's our privilege, yea, our responsibility to share it with somebody else. And we pray that men and women all over the world will be, as Paul says, like he was, and ultimately obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That said, when we do that, we're doing that very likely with people who already believe. Sure, there are sometimes we talk to people who are atheists, we talk to people who are uh, agnostic and other, other things like that. But generally speaking, when we're trying to share the gospel, we're doing that with someone who believes, which means we're trying to save a person who's already saved in their mind. And so we kind of break down our conversations, kind of get bogged down. Inevitably, as members of the Lord's Church, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Church of Christ or the Lord's Church, the church we read about in the Bible, inevitably we will share with you a passage concerning baptism. Now, it's not the case that we believe baptism is all that there is involved in salvation. We don't believe that, but it is a part. And so inevitably we'll reach a point where we will say, and you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And most times, if not always, you will, and by you, I'm talking to our friends and our family members who are religious people, devout in their beliefs, committed, and they believe themselves to be saved, and so we're having this backwards and forwards, and they will say, I don't need to be baptized. In fact, they'll say, nobody needs to be baptized in order to be saved. You have to believe. That's all you have to do. And so we will say, well, you have to be baptized. And they'll say, no, all you got to do is believe. And there are passages in the Bible that clearly say that a person needs to believe. In fact, the one we just read, the Apostle Paul said, believe on the Lord with all your house and you will be saved. And say, there, right there is a passage. I believe and then I'm saved. Well, that's not exactly what Paul said. But nevertheless, this conversation ensues. We're trying to do two things this morning in the start of our series of thoughts on salvation. Ultimately, we want to address what does the Bible teach about salvation? Is it that I simply need to believe, or is it that I need to believe and do something else relative to that? That's what we're going to inevitably discuss, and we'll do that over a series of sermons. To do so, we'd like to begin by laying some foundational thoughts as it relates to the house we're trying to build ultimately. So let's begin with a few important points to understand relative to salvation. The apostles and prophets in the New Testament will often use words, and those words, however, it needs to be noted, are the same consistent uses that those words have always been used. In, in other words, grace in the New Testament is the same scriptural doctrine as grace in the Old Testament. It's not as if the apostles and prophets in the New Testament have something new. When they talk about grace, they're talking about the same grace that God has always given men, and so we'll find that in the Old Testament. The, the word faith is the same way. When they use the word faith in the New Testament, it means the same thing that faith means in the Old Testament. Now, 
There will be different words because one's written in Greek, one's written in Hebrew, but the meaning, the doctrinal teaching behind the words are ultimately the same. Grace is always grace. Faith is always faith. Whatever it means, it means. In fact, this is the reason why the Hebrews writer in the book of Hebrews, New Testament book, writing to New Testament Christians who are struggling with faith. In fact, the entire book centers around the issue of faith. And to get them to move toward and have a proper faith, he highlights examples of people they need to emulate. And where does he begin? Well, ultimately, he begins in, he, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 4. Hebrews 11 and verse 4, the Bible says, by faith, Abel. Now, here are New Testament Christians in need of faith, and Abel is held up as a model. The New Testament Christians need the faith of Abel. And he goes on to Genesis 5 with Enoch and Genesis 6 with Noah and on and on through the letter and on and on through that chapter. He'll even move from patriarchal, the time before Moses, to the time of Moses. The, the prophets and David and others had the same faith as those before them and the same faith that the New Testament Christians need after them. So faith means faith, whatever it means, and we're going to try to find that out. The reason this is so important, and this reason is so important to understand the meaning of faith is what the Bible says about faith. In fact, I don't know personally of a more important subject than the subject of faith. I don't know of anything more significant in our relationship to God than the subject of faith. In fact, there are several things the New Testament says with regards to faith that highlight its importance. Faith, the Bible says, we see by it. In fact, Jesus talked about people who he said, they have eyes to see, but see not. There are plenty of people living in the world who can't see. Now, the reason they can't see is a lack of faith. They don't have the faith to see. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. He says, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are are eternal. In order for one to have faith, he must see the unseen. That's what Paul says. As Paul continues that thought from 2 Corinthians 4 into 2 Corinthians 5, he says in verse number 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. By sight, what he actually means is we don't walk by the appearance of things. There is a particular way things seem to be. They appear to be a certain way. Paul says we don't walk by that. In fact, it often appears that God's people are on the wrong side of things. It often appears that way. And as you read through the Bible, it looks to be the case that God's people are going to lose. Gideon stands out as an example. It sure looks like the appearance is Gideon with 300 men can't defeat 120,000. It sure looks like, as you read through all of the scriptures, that God's people, Moses, it looks like he's chosen the wrong side. Why give up Egypt, its palace, his place, his position for Hebrew slavery? Why would he choose to suffer rather than to be pampered? Why would he choose that? It appears that way, but it's not that way at all. Faith is based on knowledge, and so Paul says we walk by faith, not by the way things look to be. We walk by what we know to be true. Thirdly, he says the righteous live by it. That's said in both covenants, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Babylonians are coming. Give up. Go over. Don't stand and fight. It may appear otherwise, but do what God says. Trust God. Walk by faith. Paul repeats that, Romans 1, 17, Galatians 3, 11, Hebrews 10, and verse 38. John says of faith that it is the victory that overcomes the world. How are you going to make it from earth to heaven? Faith is how you're going to do that. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It's not just a song. It's Scripture. John says, and this is the victory, our faith. 1 John 5 and verse number 4. And maybe among all of the passages that speak to faith and its importance, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6 stands out almost singularly. The Bible says, but without it, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, 
you and I cannot please God. You go ahead and erect everything else in the world. And if it's not faith, the writer of Hebrews says you're not going to make it. It is almost singular in its nature with regards to its importance. That said, let me offer a few more keys and other thoughts as we move forward toward our sermon this morning. Now, just so you know, I do have a timer up here. <laughs> and so I am aware. But as we move toward our sermon, you mean we haven't started yet? Yeah, see, I already pushed the timer. I pushed the timer when I said good morning. <laughs> the Bible is a collection of 66 books. It's really one book, however. There is, at the very least, one theme that runs all the way through these 66 books. And what the Bible does is develop these themes and these ideas over time. And so they'll be introduced, and then they'll be developed. And as they're being developed, there will be continuity and unity and agreement as Revelation unfolds. The doctrines and the concepts will be developed and given more and more meat to the skeleton, if you will. They'll be added to, clarified, but they will never be contradicted. And so as we learn and move forward in the Bible, we're going to learn some things that are just going to be consistently true all the way through the Bible. We are saved by faith. That is the declaration. If you have your Bibles, join me in reading a few passages as we establish there and march toward our sermon this morning. I'll let you know when we get there. <laughs> Let's begin in Romans chapter 5. If you have your copy of God's Word or your electronic device, though you have silenced it, still use it. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is this small preposition called the ek, E-K. It is, denotes origin, the place of something, the start of something, the origination of something. And when it comes to salvation, the Bible says it's ek, it's out of faith. That's where salvation comes from. We're justified out of faith. Now, there are other things then that we are not justified by. Among them is we are not justified by works. You could see that in Ephesians 2, 9, where Paul says, not of works. What he means by that is not of humanly devised works, not of works that we've originated. You and I can't save ourselves, and therefore you and I can't devise plans and works and tell people, well, if you do this, you'll be saved. Well, if it came from our minds, that's not going to work. We can't tell people, oh, well, just count this number of beads, or say this mantra, or say this words, or chant these things, or do this many words. We can't originate the works. And so when Paul says, not of works, it's not out of the good works, even if they're good, that we devise and develop. But it's out of faith. He goes on to add, though, it's not out of law either. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20, as well as 3 and verse 28, it's not out of works, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, as Paul is talking about the system of justification, the way we are justified, he will contrast the law of Moses or just law in general sometimes with regards to justification. It's not out of that. It doesn't mean that law is not important. It doesn't mean law is not significant. It doesn't even mean that Christ doesn't have a law. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is law is not that which salvation flows out of. It's faith. That's what it means. How then are we saved? The Bible has this formula, and you can see it in the book of Romans as well as in the book of Ephesians. And so if you're still there in Romans 3, notice what it says in verse number 24. Paul says, being justified as a gift by the grace or by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. How is a person justified? If a person were to ask, well, Eric, how am I saved? If I said by grace, I'd be right. But we just read chapter 5. You remember that, don't you? Chapter 5, verse 1 of this same book. Therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how am I saved? Well, by grace, yes. By faith, yes. The Apostle Paul puts them together in Ephesians chapter 2, 
when he says in verse number 8, beginning, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Same language here as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What's the formula? Well, we are saved by grace. In fact, we're always going to need grace. We have to have grace. Without grace, there can be no salvation. The reason for that is really simple. By the time you need saving, you're already in sin. If you are in sin, how do you get out? If God is here and you are here and sin is between you, how do you get over sin and get back to God? Without grace, there's no way for you to do that. No man can make himself clean. No man can purge himself from his sins. And if God left us there, we would be helpless and hopeless, which is why Paul would write in chapter 5 of Romans and verse number 6, when we were without strength, when we were helpless, when we could do nothing for ourselves. It's also why grace is always referred to as free and a gift, because God is going to give you something that you can earn, you don't deserve, you're already in sin, there's no way out. And if God doesn't move toward us first, we would be helpless and hopeless. We heard a great sermon last Sunday on types and prophecies from the Old Testament. And I believe it's one of the reasons the Old Testament was written. So as Paul says in chapter 15 and verse 4 of Romans, the things that are written aforetime were written for our learning. And then he offers three things in regards to that text. Brian did a great job last week. By learning from these examples, then we can have patience, endurance, comfort, and hope. We can have that by learning. What I suggest then is when it comes to the subject of salvation, that's no different that God intends for us to learn from the Old Testament, actually, about how we are going to be saved and how people were saved. We're almost there. One more important fact. From Acts chapter 2 until the Lord returns, everybody will be saved the same way. I know it is popular in our culture and in our time for people to say, well, we're all going to heaven. We're just going different ways. You have your faith and I have mine. I don't argue politics and I don't argue religion. And I don't want to talk about it. If that's how you see it, okay, I'll see it this way. With all due respect for those kinds of positions, I want you to understand, biblically speaking, that's wrong. There are not multiple ways to be saved. After Christ rose from the dead, ascended and sat at the right hand of God, and after the gospel began to go forth into all the world as he commanded, there is only one way to be saved, and that is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Salvation is not determined by our feelings. It's not determined by our traditions. It's not determined by our thoughts, our desires, or our wishes. It's determined by God and his revelation. And whatever God has said as to how he will save a person, that's how they'll be saved. And what God has said is everybody will be saved the same way. Notice some of the passages to that end. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. To whom is the gospel to go? Everybody. What message are you to take? The gospel. There are not five messages, not ten messages. One message, take it to all the world, and those who believe it and are baptized will be saved. With regards to that gospel, Paul said it again in Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To whom? To everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is noteworthy to know that when the New Testament writers use this language of Jew and Greek or Gentile, when they use that language, they're encompassing all of humanity. All of mankind is encompassed in that phrase. And therefore, when Paul says to the Jew first and also to the Greek and to everyone, that's the same thing our Lord says, one message for everybody. He says it again in chapter 3 in verse number 21 beginning, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, it's noteworthy the word all in verse 21, 22, 23 has already been used in Romans 3 and and, and Paul says when he states, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, he states that in chapter 3 and verse 9. When he says with regards to his writings of chapter 1 and chapter 2, what are we, the Jews, better than they, the Gentiles? He says, no in no wise, for we before proved all under sin. Then he says in 22, he has a Christ unto all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned. All have sinned, there is no difference, there is only one gospel for every person to be saved. The apostle Peter says the same thing in Acts chapter 15. There is a discussion and controversy over salvation, and there are those teaching that unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. And the apostles and elders of the congregation meet to discuss the faithful brethren. And as they debate and discuss that, they eventually say that their actions are in agreement with the Holy Spirit and with prophecy. Peter stands up. Now, there are several who speak within that discussion. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, James will speak. But it's Peter's words that's so significant to this discussion, partly because Peter preached to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. And it was Peter who preached to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And it's that Peter who stood up and said these words. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? But we believe through, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. The reason this is so significant is this is not Church of Christ doctrine versus Baptist doctrine. This is whether or not a person is saved by faith is what it is. And if a person is not saved by faith, then a person is not saved. Well, what does it mean to have faith? There are two options. And I mentioned it this morning, and if I'm wrong about this, I hope somebody will go to the website and let the office know, and they'll get the information to me and let me know if I'm misrepresenting our friends and family and neighbors. Here's a religious person. I've sat and I've talked to religious people, and they believe themselves to be saved, and I'm trying to share with them the gospel. And when it comes to the subject of faith, they tell me and have told me, well, faith means all you have to do is believe and you're saved. Now, some of these people will actually and have told me, well, I was baptized. It just didn't have anything to do with my salvation. I was baptized after I was saved. And the reason I was saved is because I believed, and I didn't have to do anything else. In fact, you don't have to do anything else. In order to be saved, all you have to do is believe. Now, if that's a misrepresentation of our friends and family's position, somebody please let me know that, but that's what I've been told. So that's what faith is. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and therefore I'm saved. This might be called faith only or some other phraseology to describe it. Now, if this is what faith is biblically, well, then that's what it is. There is another option, though. Faith could mean that, yes, I believe, just like that. I believe what God said. And I do whatever he tells me. If God tells me to do something, my belief moves me to do that, and I'm not saved until I do what God says. 
And so faith either means I believe and I don't do anything, or faith means I believe and then I do whatever God said. One of these is biblical. What I'm asking you to do for the last several minutes of our study this morning is to study with me and see which one the Bible teaches. Where would we find that? Well, let's begin in the book of Genesis. In fact, it's almost the beginning of all my studies. Because when the Bible teaches something, what we're going to find is it's going to be consistent with itself. It's going to build upon those things, and it's going to oh, inevitably be uh, consistent with what it says. We're introduced to the subject of salvation, certainly on a large scale in Genesis chapter 6. Now, when we read Genesis, we open up the Bible and we start reading forward. In fact, as we read the book of Genesis, friends, you should just believe what you're reading. You should just keep on reading and you just believe as you go. The Bible is to be taken literally unless something in the context demands a figurative explanation. So you just start reading and keep on reading. If you read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, you'll read about the creation of the world. If you read Genesis chapter 3, you'll read about the introduction of sin into the world. If you read Genesis chapter 4, you'll read about the first time men sacrificed to God. If you read Genesis chapter 5, you'll read about a genealogy that connects us from Adam to Noah. And if you make it to chapter 6, you'll read about salvation. The first time the subject is broached, Genesis chapter 6. And I'm going to urge what we find here, you'll find consistently throughout the whole of the Bible. What do we find? Let's begin with an outline of the text. Genesis chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, you will find a problem. That problem is going to be identified in verse number 5. That problem is sin. In verses 6 and 7, you will find punishment. God will judge. In fact, sin deserves judgment, and so God will judge. In verses 8 to 12, you will find, in verses 9 to 12, you will find a person. And so you have a problem, sin, you have punishment, God will judge, you have a person, Noah. God uses people to save people. You will then find a plan because God always gives a plan for how to be saved. And so you'll find that in verses 14 to 17. That plan culminates in a place because God often places salvation in a particular place and you need to get there. And so there's a place of salvation. And ultimately, you will find pardon. God will save. Man was in sin, Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5. You can read that. The Lord saw the wickedness of man that it was great in the earth. Every imagination of thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Verse number 6 says, it grieved God at his heart that he made man. That's what the problem is. Man has given himself to sin. Well, what does that evoke? God's judgment. Verse number 7, the Lord said, I will blot out man from whom I've created from the face of the land animals and beasts of the earth and everything that creeps in birds, God says, I will destroy. I'm sorry I made it. Man has sinned and he deserves judgment and God will judge. But before God judges, he always gives grace. It's one of the reasons it's not a New Testament concept. We're in the sixth chapter of the Bible. We've already talked about what we find in the first five. And the first time salvation is broached, we find verse number eight. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace first, always grace first. Why? As we've said in verse 5, we're already in sin. If we're in sin, how do we get out? You can't get out of sin on your own. And so you need God's grace. And so God will give it because God is gracious, infinitely good and gracious. In verses 9 to 12, we're introduced to Noah. Here is the person. God will use Noah. He is called a just man. He is called a, a, a man who walked with God. Not only did Noah walk with God, one of the great things about Noah is in a world of sin, in a world of wickedness, and so described that every image is difficult sometimes to grasp and appreciate the words used in the Bible fully. Can you imagine? Work on it for just a minute. Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually. Find some good in there. Every day, all day, one commentator said men woke up to do evil, thought about it all day, went to bed, slept on it, thought about it some more, woke up and continued to do evil. Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil. And in that, that cesspool of evil, there is a man who is just and a man who walks with God. Nobody is going to tell God, the world got so bad, I couldn't do good. Noah will stand up in judgment and say, I did. But not only did Noah do good, Noah's wife did good. 
Noah's sons did good. Their three wives did good. There are eight people who are living a righteous and godly life in the wake of all of that sin. How is Noah going to get out? How is Noah going to be saved? Well, here's what we've talked about so far. Verse number five, there's sin. Verse number seven, there's judgment. We mentioned grace in verse number eight, and then we get to verse number 13. The grace of God is going to be revealed because Noah doesn't have faith yet. How is Noah going to get faith? Verse number 13, the Bible says, then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Now, it's interesting that you and I appreciate how faith comes. The Bible will later say, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Without the word of God, we can't have faith in God. Since the word means trust, you can't trust him if he doesn't say something. You can't trust him if he doesn't reveal his mind to you. You can't have anything to trust. In fact, if you wanted a really quick answer to Acts chapter 16, when people say, well, yeah, Paul said all you have to do is believe. Paul didn't say all you have to do is believe. Paul said believe on the Lord. But if you were to keep reading in Acts chapter 16, let me ask you this. What would a Philippian jailer believe? It's why if you keep reading, the next few verses will say, Paul spoke the word of God to him. Telling somebody to believe, he doesn't know what to believe. He needs the word of God. That's how faith comes. Coincidentally, if you and I try to have faith in God about things God didn't say, then we can't do that. You can't go around making up stuff and then say, I'm going to do it by faith. Well, not if God didn't promise it. If God promised it, you can trust it. If God didn't say it, don't you make it up and then try to hold God to keep it. It's not the way faith works. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So now you and I stand in the place of Noah, and verse number 13, God said, the end of all flesh has come before me. Please note, now Noah can have faith. Because now Noah knows what God is going to do. I'm going to destroy the world, Noah. Note the difference between verse 7 and verse 13. Verse number 7, this decision to judge the world and destroy it has already been made. Verse number 7, the Bible says, the Lord said. The Lord said. To whom did he say that? I'm going to urge that he said that to the Godhead. The Godhead determined the judgment is coming. That determination has been made. At that point, Noah doesn't know it either. It's why we find grace in verse number 8. What's part of the grace? Well, part of the grace is to tell Noah because that's what grace does. The grace of God teaches us how to have faith in God. That's the way it works. And so Paul would say to Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world. Well, the grace of God teaches us that which we could not know. Again, 1 Corinthians 2, 8 to 13, why that section of Scripture is so important. Without revelation, we wouldn't know the mind of God. Without revelation, Noah couldn't know the mind of God. The decision to destroy the world has already been made, verse 7. But we get to verse 13, and now God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. One of the flaws with this position is this position holds that all I have to do is believe the facts. And while in Scripture there are facts stated that we need to believe, it is the case that when it comes to the subject of salvation, when it comes to the subject of Christian living, when it comes to the subject of worship, that you and I won't simply have facts to believe, we'll have obligations to meet. And so God will not just tell you a fact. He will tell you what he's going to do, and then he will tell you what he requires of you to do. And so notice the difference and the transition from verse 13 to verse 14. Verse 13 is what God is going to do. God says unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am going to destroy the earth with the flood. I'm going to do that. That's what God's going to do. 
But does Noah believe that? How will God know that Noah believes that? Because God then follows it with verse 14. Since that's what I'm going to do, Noah, here's what I want you to do. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall you make within the ark, inside and out with pitch. This is how you will make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. The breadth of it, 50 cubits. The height of it, 30 cubits. And then he continues, you shall make a window for the ark. Finish it to a cubit from the top of the set the door in the ark. In the side of it, you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And then he returns to verse 17 to what he's going to do. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Here is what God's going to do. Here is what he requires of Noah. But if faith is simply mental assent, then we should stop at verse 13. Because if Noah believes that God will destroy the world, then Noah should be saved right there. But I would ask you this. Does Noah need to build the ark? Because it's God who said, make the ark. Now, why would you make the ark? It's because you believe verse 13. If I believe God's going to destroy the world and that's where I live, then he's going to destroy me too. But if he told me to make an ark, let me ask it another way. What would you do if you were Noah? Would you say to God, I believe that you're going to destroy the world, and I know you told me to build an ark, but if I built the ark, I'd be trying to earn my salvation, and therefore I'm not going to build it. <laughs> Would you have not built the ark? We didn't make it to the end of the chapter. Here's what I'm saying. When you are studying your Bible, and please, friends, listen, this is not for members of the church exclusively. This is for everybody. When you're studying your Bible, do this and make sure you do this, young, old, and everybody. Everybody draws conclusions. Everybody has beliefs. Everybody does. What you want to do is you want to take your belief. God does this amazing thing of drawing word pictures so we can see what he's saying because it's so full of action and the, the pictures are so vivid, it'd be impossible to miss them. So you take your conclusions, whatever it is, and you bring your conclusions over to the Bible, and then you lay it over the Bible. And then you see if your conclusion matches what you read in Scripture. And if what you brought over to the Bible from your conclusion, if it doesn't read the same then you renounce your conclusion and you take what the Bible says. Now, again, with no intention of misrepresentation, our religious friends, and if you are a member of a, a religious group, what they call Protestant and Christendom and that sort of thing, if, if that's where you are this morning, you've likely been taught this, that all you have to do is believe. There is no insult to that. There is no disrespect, no meaning of attack. That's just what you've been taught. And what I'm telling you this morning and trying to show you from Scripture is the other option is you believe and then you do whatever God says. We take those and we bring them over to the Bible and we read, which is why we would ask. God has given his grace in verse 8. God has given his commands in verses 14 to 17. And now we stand trying to apply one of these as faith in the Bible. We're in the sixth chapter of the Bible, friends. And what I said in the introduction was people in the New Testament were told to have the faith of people in the Old Testament. So from Genesis 6, faith is not going to mean something different as we go forward. Grace is not going to mean something different as we go forward. Which one of those is biblical? Which one of those do you read? If we just finish the chapter, we won't have to guess. Because verse 22 says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. If we were to go into chapter 7, from about verse 21, we would read, all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. 
of all that was on the dry land and all whose nostrils of the breath of the Spirit died, they see blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from animals to creeping things and birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. Friends, in order to get into the ark, you have to build the ark. If Noah doesn't build the ark, he can't be saved. The way it works is you're in sin, and you're going to need God's grace. Sandwiched between grace and faith are always going to be commands. In fact, as we progress through this material, the commands will change, but very, else, very little else will. Those commands tell us how to have faith, and after the demonstration of that faith, then God saves. Friends, that's the plan of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. It never changes. Noah was saved by grace. Noah was given commands. Noah did what God said, and inevitably and ultimately, God saved Noah. You know, if we took that same outline and we hurriedly rushed it into the New Testament, we'd have the same thing. We have a problem. The problem is the same today. The problem is sin. It's your problem, sin in your life. How do you get out? You can't get out. And so, that sin will be punished. In another sermon on death, I remember saying to somebody, if death gets to you before you get to Jesus, friends, it is as sad as any human being could ever be. No, sin will be punished, and God will judge. But God has given a person. The person is not Noah. No, the Savior of the world is Jesus. Jesus is given a plan. That plan is the gospel. God wants it preached to every person in all of the world. That plan will culminate in a place. Salvation is not in the ark. It's in Jesus Christ, and you need to get there. And if you are, well, then God will pardon and God will save. Friends, that's what you need to do this morning if you haven't. Now, we'll continue this series of thoughts, but I do hope you know you've heard the sermon. You just might hear it 15 different ways but we can't change a thing about God's plan of salvation. If you're not a member of the Lord's body this morning, we invite you. We beg you. In fact, we wish we could do more to encourage you to become a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, but to be saved by faith. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and change your heart and mind. Repent. Confess the name of Christ and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins and let God save you this morning. And friends, if you've never done that, you need to. If you are his child and you've lived in a way that's not pleasing to him, the faith that moves us to salvation is the faith that sustains us in our Christian walk. And so if you need the prayers of the saints, if we can help in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.